five, four, three, two, one. Good, good afternoon from Miami. It's Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. We have an episode of the uh, Sudan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds. Uh, and today we have the pleasure of having Gaffer al Haj. A uh, neurosurgeon from Somal, uh, excuse me, from Sudan, now in Oman, going to present. Uh, and this is actually, uh, we have a variety of panelists. First, before we turn it over to Gaffer, let's meet all the panelists. Hello, Joffrey, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, you hear me well. I am Dr. Jafar Sanusi. Sudanese neurosurgeon practicing in uh, no, no, I'm sorry, Gaffer. Let's meet the panelists first, okay? Good hold on, hold on, jo hold on, Gaffer. Joffrey, could you please introduce yourself? You're on mute, okay? Go ahead, Joffrey. Can you hear me, Joffrey? No. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, introduce yourself, please. Yes, yes, I'm here. Could you, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Portilla uh, from Ecuador. I'm neurosurgeon. Okay, neurosurgeon from Ecuador. Vanta? Yeah, hello, everybody. I am Dr. Vanta from Cambodia. I'm now uh, doing my fellowship in France for two years. Well, welcome. Uh, Mermouche, welcome. Hi, I'm Mermouche Gorgian. I'm a research fellow from Boston. Very good. And Rakesh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry if my video is not available. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, everyone from India. I'm Dr. Rakesh Avi, a neurosurgery resident from India, a long-term member of Neurosurgical TV. I'm glad to be a part of this Sudanese uh, Grand Rounds Neurosurgical. Thank you so much. You're yeah, welcome. And we'll meet various other panelists as they start. And welcome, Gaffer. It's all yours. Could you please introduce yourself and before you start your presentation? Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Good afternoon or good morning or depending on everywhere. I am Dr. Jaffer, neurosurgeon, practice in uh, Sudanese, practice in Sultanate of Oman. You hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Yeah. My team also hear, hear me well? Yes, we have your voice. Yes, we can see it well. Hello? Yes, we can see your presentation very well. Okay. We are going to discuss today is uh, actually the glioblastoma and it is very broad topic. And there are a lot of information to cover. I am not able to cover everything on this slide. But uh, for you and we can answer questions that we may not have time uh, to cover. You hear me? Yes. Uh, introduction. Uh, by way of introduction, by saying, hello? Yes. Glioblastoma is the primary brain tumor. And that to be distinguished from other kind of tumor that is spread from the body, which we call uh, metastasis, metastatic tumor. The Sudan team not join us yet? Yes, it's introduction. And fairly, these are a fairly uncommon cancer relative to other cancer. And in fact, they rank roughly on number of 15 or so on the list of all cancer. However, there is a significant number I took this uh, number uh, from USA because we don't have uh, our own data. So this number from USA. When you could include all the primary tumor, and unfortunately there are a lot of deaths that occur from this tumor. So compared to other cancers, the survival is not as good. They are incurable by definition. Although we do have some patients that do extremely well and has really outlived average. Okay. And 
Some patients divide the oats and most affect the middle age to older adults. Up to now, no uh, not known risk factor. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So this is just by chart to show the distribution of primary brain tumor. And what you can see in this slide is the glioblastoma makes roughly about 16% of all, of all tumor. Our old primary tumor. That includes some benign, like uh, this meningioma, okay? Uh, and now about term of the glioma, which by definition is malignant, as I said uh, uh, earlier. Glioblastoma, here, yeah. glioblastoma in the malignant tumor makes up roughly a little more than half of all this tumor. And then there is a small distribution of the other lower grade tumor, uh, either grade uh, three or grade two. This some risk factor I collected. Okay. Risk factor, they can affect old age, but glioblastoma, as I mentioned earlier, usually affect the middle age and older adult. And because we are society nowadays uh, living uh, longer, we are diagnosed more of this tumor, especially in the elderly population. If someone had exposure to ionized radiation, okay, like treatment for other tumor in the childhood, for example, from leukemia and he have radiation to the head, he may develop a brain tumor later in the life. Uh, these are creating a rare case. So, and there has been great search to look for environmental risk factor. We are probably, I think, and uh, most of us uh, thinking nowadays probably is something in environment that is factor, but has yet to be identified. These rarely run in family, okay? Rarely hereditary. This is some uh, glioma classification, routine classification. Okay, so how do we classify this tumor? They are classified by cell that makes them up to that we can see under the microscope. And so they are either astrocytoma or oligodendroglioma or even dimom, this by cell type. Then they are graded by microscopic, this one. Feature so that you see in the upper panel, low grade. Here is the low grade. Here is the low grade, and here is the glioblastoma or grade four astrocytoma. You hear me well? Hello? This is the we can continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Continue, continue. Continue. Okay. As for it is important to know the term, uh, terminology when we are talking about this tumor, about the pathological feature and all these issues. Okay. Good. Are we good up to here? High grade glioma in general in malignant incurable by definition. Low grade glioma generally affect younger age. Malignant, still, still it is malignant, but less aggressive. Some have long term survival. Some pe people with low grade glioma have some long term survival. And here is the favorable prognostic factor.
good performance status, if end of surgical resection, low grade, is more uh, favorable than high grade molecular. This for just revision as introductory and molecular marker. This is different kind of side tumor, with, but for we have glioma, particularly glioblastoma. These are two most important ones. MGMT uh, promoter, methylation, and uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase, one mutation, IDH1, and uh, O6 missile guanine, missile transferase promoter. I have a couple of slides, and this is a little bit complicated. What I really want to, to come away with uh, for this slide is that having misylation of uh, the MGMT promoter is better prognostic factor, and that uh, is shown in this curve. Okay. Prognostic factor and showing this care where they analyze patients who are uh, on the original chemozolomide clinical trial. And they found that if you have misylation of this promoter, you have better survival in 10 out through that only about 40% of patients with the glioblastoma have misylated promoter. And exactly what does this mean? And what does this do for you? This is a little complicated, but basically what's happening is you have methylation of this gene promoter, you are not expressing protein. And when that protein is expressed, it actually undergo damage of this DNA of the cell. This is a MG methylation. Uh, Timozolomide is doing to the tumor DNA. So again, this is the concept that difficult for me to explain. I think all of us in the field would say this because it is a sort of like saying double negative. But the whole point is that having the missileization is better prognostic factor now. Okay. And if you are unmessilated, well, you, it is less favorable, less favorable if I'm mis misylated here, but it's better prognostic factor. And uh, to tell patients that uh, I never like to tell patients that you know you are distinct failed if you have uh, unmyelinated MGMT. And this is a test that can be routinely done here. I think this in house uh, nowadays. That about MGMT. Now, what about uh, IDH? Okay, sorry, it was for electricity issues. I just trade the hydrogen. Yes. What about the IDH? This is enzyme, it is to stand for isocitrate dehydrogenase and the key point again to come away from this slide is that having the mutation is good thing. So the mutation is actually quite uncommon in the glioblastoma. Only about 5% of patients will have it, but it leads to significant better prognosis so on the order of overall survival, uh, 45 months, which is very significant for glioblastoma. Whereas in the low grade glioma population, there's significant higher in percentage, 8%. Higher percentage in, in, in all. Patients that have some mutation and this in part explain why low grade glioma have better survival and prognosis. Uh, than this. Now I want to talk about uh, just some general feature of glioblastoma and a lot of this is in common to kind of glioma. So what are the symptoms that would lead to diagnosis? Well, we usually like to break it down into what we call generalized 
or focus symptom. So generalized symptoms are ones that don't necessarily localize to where the tumor is coming from. So headache, of course, headache, uh, we always like to tell people it is not a sign of having brain tumor. They are usually more than just headache, 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 headache. Seizures, even uh, so they can open lateral uh, to one side, if patient can lateral eye to one side or a body, uh, symptom of his generalized symptom, then confusion. Confusion also is generalized symptom, not to, uh, local, to localize, but it may raise the flag. Uh, and also this uh, focal, if any uh, vision fiber is compressed by mass, patient may have a vision defect or in the motor area, patient weakness, language affected for cerebellum, also loss of coordination. This is the focal that tell you where the exactly the tumor is. The diagnosis image, all, all symptoms lead to imaging. So usually our best friend is MRI. Mass on MRI is not always a tumor. There's other, other, another issue can mimic tumor, like abscess and, and uh, multiple sclerosis, this. So not every mass on the MRI to be considered as tumor. We have to be careful. Till we take surgical uh, specimen and uh, take a uh, histopathology diagnosis. Yes, MRI can predict, but not a diagnosis. This to be in mind. Now the multidisciplinary team who will uh, just show you that the patient you are being incorporated into team efforts so you have multiplayer involved usually begin you will have a, a neurosurgeon here sometimes you will introduce to neuro-oncologist as a team of uh, treatment of the glioblastoma um, before surgery, but usually right afterwards, then you will, the neuro-oncology uh, is the best friend uh, before surgery and during surgery and after surgery, it will be better. And if have radiation treatment done by radiation, oncologist also, and of course, we will not forget the nerves cannot be underemphasized. Often we'll have the tremendous continuity with the patient throughout their course as, of course, social workers are helpful in terms of helping with uh, psychosocial need and then these two are sort of behind the scene. Clear the person that interpret tissue pathologist. Pathologist also is very important and uh, neuroradiologists who interpret it this image. Okay, up to here. So what do we usually do if we uh, see something like, I just show you on the MRI, and well, first thing is that we would like to meet together newly diagnosed tumor. If newly diagnosed tumor, what we will do? We will uh, not only surgeon, but neuro-oncologists also meet together with the patient. We typically have discussion before surgery that involves something like, it looks like you may have a brain tumor and we are entirely certain till we can actually get sample of it. And this is what might happen if turn out to be tumor. It is always important to be carefully about this because we have been pulled before and some of things that can mimic the brain tumor are things like abscess, which infection in the brain or in multiple sclerosis region or stroke. And we have certainly gone into surgery thinking that something was going to be killer and it tends to be disaster and to be something else. 
So if we have kind of suspicions that sometimes glioblastoma, we try to do maximum surgery to remove as much of the tumor as possible and not uh, that secondary part is very important because that follows the treatment that are going to cause safety symptoms. This is surgery, maximum safety resection, and our aim to minimize permanent neurological deficit. And if you are able to take gross total resection, it's independent, but it is good prognostic factor, but it's not guarantee that you remove the tumor. Even you do total gross resection 100%, because we know there's microscopic infiltration from the GBA. Here some method to increase the extent of resection. One of them, uh, of course, awake craniectomy, uh, because patient while awake, he can guide you, and you can manipulate the area, and you know further in digging, removing the tumor. Fluorescent dye, one of the evolving, and help in maximum resection. Endoscopic surgery nowadays also, it's uh, very effective. And if you are in high setup, intraoperative MRI, also good for uh, maximum safety resection. Here are some cases just for uh, refreshment. Uh, 62 year old, he presented with headache and he was found to have this ring enhancement. Right frontal lobe. And so whenever you look at the MRI, the orientation is the side right. This is the right side. And it is left side looking up to the patient from the same side. This was in good location for surgery. There was very nice resection here, if you see. And he actually used fluorescein dye to help him visualize, this is our boss, to visualize the tumor by fluorescein dye. And exact to know the exact margin of the tumor. This is fluorescein dye. Uh, this look like here, so this the dye that inject into the vein and it is light up. And because glioblastoma has very abnormal vessel, that supply them, you can use this side to your advantage to help you see the edge of the tumor, which uh, is hope is that you can get better resection from the tumor. And uh, the, actually the surgery result is good. This is another one case, 50, uh, eight year old, uh, man who presented with seizure and he had relatively small tumor. You follow me? Yeah, we follow you. Yeah, we're here. Okay, no question, we will continue. Same as I said, this is a 50 year old man who present with seizure and he had relatively small tumor that was located, however, in the dominant hemisphere. A small tumor, but in the dominant hemisphere. Yeah, in the dominant hemisphere, in the left temporal lobe. So, usually, this is a very kind of a, a scary location when it comes to doing surgery in terms of uh, potential to cause risk in terms of language, because this is a language area. And so in this case, this patient surgery was done while he, the patient is awake, awake perinatal, which uh, kind of weird, but some of you have made this kind of surgery. I think all of you have experienced such things. And know that the brain itself does not have brain fiber, so you can uh, take the advantage of that by doing awake surgery and the patient can help you to guide you in the term of surgery. And uh, this case was all about talking to his patient and make sure making he didn't have any deterioration in the language. During surgery, as a result, we are able to achieve very nice surgical resection. 
This is also an interesting case. Uh, is a 42 year old female presented with some vision change, and she had uh, some cognitive changes as well. And uh, she had uh, this mass, ring enhanced mass, center in the left salamus. And this traditionally location where many people would not even attempt to operate. In. But nowadays, uh, the use of endoscopy and board device, uh, typical operative surgeon was able to do the incredible surgery and remove all of the tumor. This is functional MRI, this is the tumor, and this is the port, and this is the post op feature. Here, the surgery is done. The uh, sulcus. They attack the tumor through the cerebral sulcus and minimal manipulation and no damage to the surrounding tissue. Uh, usually, those uh, use this port for the hemorrhage, but in the tumor also is helpful. Now I come back to the medical management. Uh, some medical issues that all every day we deal with and these are ones that you know usually at the beginning of the diagnosis and then often throughout the course of the disease we are managing so i am going to cover each one of these categories by one slide cerebral edema seizure fatigue and dvt and psychosocial cerebral uh, edema known as for a common, a common language for other, uh, our medical college, it's known as uh, brain swelling. So whenever people talk about the swelling, you know, technically the term is cerebral edema. The way we treat brain swelling or brain edema should be based on the patient, not on the MRI scan or CT scan. I mean, uh, for clinical, not radiological. Of course, uh, if you see in the MRI scan, there is a lot of pressure being built up as a result of the tumor with the massive surrounding edema. Even patient not symptomatic, if you may go start the steroid for that management. Still in the edema. Dexamethasone is the most widely and can be used. This is our regime, but uh, everybody has uh, their own. And one of the most common dexamethasone, all of you familiar with it, and uh, it is considered fairest treatment of the brain tumor back roughly in 1940 or 50, I'm not sure for the date. And think about this dexamethasone is that our patient is usually can be given twice a day quite effective so one of the things that we often do is if we see someone getting it more than twice a day we will taper it down to twice a day because it has fairly long half-life the half-life of the drug is long and activity in the body is good <coughs> and also it is better to take second dose of dexamethasone afternoon because one of the side effects is insomnia. So if you give the medication to patient around 8 or 9 p.m., you really give him tough time and rough night to sleep. Okay. So ranging of the dose roughly, for practically speaking, between 5, 4 to 16 milligram. Once you get beyond 16, as an outpatient, we are going to run into more side effects. So 16 is the uh, upper limit in the practice. So kind of administration uh, uh, of diminishing retain steroid, uh, the side effect is called the steroid myopathy. And it is important side effect to know about, and this is open what limit long-term use of the drugs. 
Uh, myopathy, all of you are manifested in patient early in muscles, and there's a primary way to be on, that, uh, on it. Because people have difficulty in getting out of care if they are on long-term medication, or they are difficult to climb a stair sometimes. And even uh, walking itself, so the steroid myopathy is the most common those limiting side effects. Seizure. Seizure are fairly common in turn out that glioblastoma patients have seizure at various times during their illness. They actually have less seizure in general than the low. Seizure is uh, general less, but at the end there is uh, one. The main takeaway point, which is sometimes uh, counterintuitive for this seizure, that we call either complex partial, well, that means if uh, they start on one side of the body, so you might have a little bit twitching of your uh, arm, for example, and then all of the sudden the patient will sort of loss of consciousness. And in some cases, it could even generalize to whole body, which is uh, what we call tonic colonic or grand mal seizure. And these seizures are pretty similar to the way that we treat epilepsy in our uh, neurology population. We usually start with uh, one medication and we maximize the dose. Then if we need second medication, we add on after and we prefer Nowadays, the second generation of drug. And by the second generation, I mean that uh, drugs that have been around, of course, for past 10 or 15 years. And why do we almost replace the old drug like the antine, antigratol, antipetine? For example, there is no role for preventive, preventing. There is no role for preventing seizure in some who has never had seizure before. So typically do not just will start this on patient unless there is actual seizure because it will not, uh, there is no prophylaxis. This uh, just to, rem uh, to remind you by list of the drugs, new drugs. And this is what we call second generation drugs that many of you familiar with. Uh, Ebra or repetitive sum and uh, by far most widely used the drug and reason for that it is easy to start and effective though some of uh, these drugs on the list like lamotrogy here which is a very good example we are next of his wonderful drug but it takes a long time to get up to an effective dose and you can see some of the other of these this like usually try to get by with medica one medication, but if we need second one, we will add. But usually we start with one up to maximum dose, then we will add the second one. Okay, what about uh, fatigue? This is a very common symptom. Uh, probably one of the most common symptoms for any one that being through radiation. It is really reflection of this side effect of radiation with some uh, degree of the effect of the brain tumor. It is usually peak a halfway through the course of radiation. So six, usually six cycles, or quarter of radi radiation that we are going to talk about in the letter and we will seem to where the middle to the end of the radiation. And in some patients, that will linear even well beyond the end of the radiation. The terrible with the fatigue is there. Really no proof and treatment, no proof and treatment for the fatigue. So one of the great breakthrough in our field would be more effectively treat the fatigue. But there are certainly things that we now try. For example, exercise can be very helpful and we here we encourage all our patients, even before we start radiation, to get in habit of daily exercise. Uh, talking, uh, we are talking about just casual work, nothing heavy. And then there are some drugs that uh, well used, so methyl uh, pendate or 
relative. It's what most people associate with treating attention. This is this medication for uh, treating attention deficit disorder. But it actually has some proven effectiveness in the cancer-related fatigue. And uh, the, the lower one, uh, modafinil and armadate, now new drugs. And we uh, try to use it. OK. And actually have some proven uh, effectiveness. And they are uh, new drugs. And we sometimes use in some of our patients. But these are very either plus or minus. You know, in some cases, they can really help. And in the other case, they don't help at all. So up to now, just for the sake of the lecture, but we don't use it more like this. Now, what about uh, the blood clot or uh, we take a, a talk about the blood clot in technical term DVT or pulmonary embolism DV, which is some uh, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. One of the things that a lot of people in the medicine do not realize is the glial blastoma have very high tendency to cause blood clot, clotting. They are roughly number three on the list of all cancer in terms of their ability to cause DVT and DE, typically like they use blood thinner or inferior venicava filter. Things that uh, misunderstood among our uh, medicine colleagues is that you think that you cannot put a brain tumor patient on the blood thinner. Because if you put him, uh, he's going to cause massive bleeding in the brain. And that's simply not the case. You know, they have been a good study that uh, have shown that the risk of the bleeding from my blood center on order of about only 5%, very low. We really like to use the low molecular weight heparin. It's commonly referred to as the NOH or uh, Lenovex. Probably the most common use product on the market over warfarin. Orthodomine. And then there is new drug that is factor uh, 10 inhibitor. But the 10 inhibitor, so we have been excited to see that as this have gained approval and treating in the medical population. We are also able to use them in the glioblastoma population. And these are the drug like illiquid and productive, for example. So they are setting where you cannot use anticoagulation. So if blood clot is discovered immediately after surgery or if there is active bleeding in the brain, you are really kind of forced to use one of these filters, which is inserted with the catheter through the leg vein and has this contraindication. It is important not that, of course, this tumor and debilitating psychologically. So we re, uh, really heavily on uh, really heavily on our colleague in social work and psychiatry and psychology, obtaining way of determining if someone is depressed or fatigued by questionnaire that we had out is very helpful because otherwise we may not uh, ever know patient may not necessarily volunteer this information. I mean, having uh, having brain tumor support group is very helpful. Thing, and I hope that uh, many of you and out there have attended one in your area because you really gain a lot by seeing what other people are going through and who have similar condition on the brain tumor group support. Very effective. Next part of talk is talking about the standard therapy for glioblastoma. So this is uh, where we really get into the treatment. So up till now, Yes, we kind of talk about introduction, about, uh, you know, what are these tumor and how diagnosis uh, and what imaging of them look like uh, and what some of the symptoms that you, you are going to deal with and how are those managed, managed. Now we are going to talk specifically about the treatment that we give that are specific to treat the tumor and then the last part is going to talk about some of the emerging treatments that are in setting of clinical trial. I will talk about the clinical trial at the end. 
So this is just timeline that show you, you know, glioblastoma have been around for a long time. And you know, like I was mentioned earlier, blue corticoid dexamethasone. Where is the pointer? I missed the pointer. What is my here? Yeah. Here is drug come wide into acceptance, and this is actually putting it around early 60. It was really probably in you know earlier lab, and then came radiation. There's the radiation number two and uh, mid, mid 70, 1970, start using drug called DCNU and CCNU, which are sort of uh, forerunner uh, to timosolomide. And then we had type of uh, waiver that was inserted in the surgical cavity. Surgical cavity, you will insert something and that was uh, called Lyldell, that was in the mid-90s, and then most recent breakthrough was that uh, temozolomide, which come into wide use around 2005 and up to the present. Uh, now is combined with radiation. So we are going to talk about this is standard treatment that include radiation, chemotherapy, and tumor treating field, TTF, which actually could have been, human shooting field could have been added to this plot coming in most recently about two years ago. So this is Dr. Stopsam. So this is standard referred to stop vision and after Dr. Stop, who was the lead author in this large clinical trial that was done actually showed the timozolomide or uh, chemo radiation effectiveness when combined with the radiation. So this is a six week course of radiation and this drawing down here, this drawing down here, uh, show your radiation field. We, we call it radiation field, the radiation field and delivered fairly wide field and have highest concentration around the margin of the tumor, but then it moved and scattered out. Concentration is scattered out the radiation. And this is largely the reason, let's see here for some minutes, some of these side effects like fatigue and cognitive impairment, uh, relies from radiation, all this simple. Now, chemozolomide, or, or uh, the trade name is chemodar, uh, actually built from chemotherapy. So it is convenient for the patient, so that can be taken at home. Radiation is delivered in standard dose across the board, as uh, our Dr. Wild know. So we never deviate from this 60 degree dose, although they are active clinical trials that they testing slightly, they want to increase the dose from 60 gay GY, but it's still under study. And uh, typically 30, 3, 0. Typically 30 fraction is the routine so in our practice, Monday through Friday, with breaks on weekend, and uh, uh, Temodar is taking during radiation every day, including the weekend. And then after uh, month break, we have six to 12 cycle of uh, Temodar, given uh, on the standard five out of 20 days. So five days on and 23 days off. Patient will check for five days, then to three, four, and like that every cycle. And the main issue with the temozar or uh, temozolomide is what we call thrombocytopenia. This is the main issue of uh, temozolomide nowadays, it's causing thrombocytopenia. So sometimes just only low blood gate and rarely cause. Uh, Pure drop in the white blood cell count, pancytopenia. But it's just in not significant effect 
only on the platelet. That is the rare. Some has bleeding as a result of uh, using hemosolomide. And this is, uh, if there is pancytopenia, you have to withdraw the chemotar from the equation. That's why those limited by low blood pressure. This is actually hemodar. And what do you really like the concept of knowing mechanism of things? It is very helpful to understand data. So this is a drug that is very interesting because when it hit the stomach, it is immediately broken down into small molecules, easy and quickly end up uh, the stomach. And that is very important, this breaking into molecule, because this huge limitation to treating brain tumor is to find this drug that will actually get across the blood-brain barrier. And you know, blood-brain barrier is a very special evolutionary mechanism that we have as a human, basically keep a lot of things that would be toxic to us out of the brain. But at the same time, we need something to come inside to help us. So many chemotherapy drugs that are effective in other cancer here cannot work. That's the reason we use Temodar and uh, Temonardos in this, in what we call alkylating agent. And what that means, it is actually attached this methyl group, okay? Uh, into certain position of DNA of the tumor and ultimately lead to unraveling of the tumor and ultimately to die as a result and tumor uh, cell will die. So we never speaking die or death in the tumor. It is good thing because that what we want to do now matter has some nausea. This drug has some nausea and uh, causing nausea and yeah, always. We already talk about that, how it can affect the platelet and like kind of chemotherapy. Chemodar can affect the rapid dividing cell of the body, including the bone marrow. It will cause bone marrow separation. And that's the reason why it gets too low platelet. Tumor treating field. I mentioned this was the most recent breakthrough in terms of the standard treatment, this was based on large clinical trial. It was randomized where a patient received either two tumor treating field or not. And this summary of the study, 700 patients with glioblastoma, they randomized them to one group or other. They all went through the radiation and uh, temodar to standard treatment. But there was some issue with this trial, one is that there was no shame device. So if you were randomized to not have the device, you knew it and those that's who had the device knew it. So that can lead to bias and compounding effect of the trial. And this who have the device arguably could have closer follow up and good palliative care also. Also, there was crossover allowed. So if you are progressing later on, your could actually be eligible for the TTS device. The device is not driver. It is required head shaving, and some people will not allow to shave their head. And it is there, back pain. You have to hold it in your back, attached to the device, and you have to carry around with you has all the time. And some people here are uh, expensive uh, financially. It is very expensive. And maybe uh, not under insurance in some areas like this. This is what it uh, looks like. So certain data that came out of this trial compelling there was a, uh, the demonstrated cervical advantage in patients treated with this device. But I would say that this device is probably one of the more divisive things and no pun intended. In 
neuro oncology field, there are some people really believe in the recommended to all their patients. Other people do not. And a lot of clinical trials are designed, at least as of now, do not incorporate TTF, the device, into the trial. Nobody puts the trial, this device in trial. Okay, what about treatment once you with recurrent? In the recurrent status, unfortunately, in most cases, glioblastoma is going to recur, but some point in the time. So one of the things we think about very heavily is clinical trial looking in the promised new treatment. In some cases, second surgery is done. This is becoming more popular nowadays because some clinical trial involving implanting different type of drug or immunotherapy into tumor cavity and they require surgery to be at some time very radiation, sometimes radiation of a second time. All this is standard treatment on the recurrent phase. Uh, especially this afastin or BTC zoom up, uh, which I will talk about in detail, which many of you know about some Times we use other scheme of giving a uh, temozolomide while uh, another thing is still an option. Those who have not ready received tumor treatment feel that an option and BCNU waiver or Glyldel waiver are sometimes used, but it has really fallen out of favor largely because of some of the side effects. And that can occur with them and the fact that many clinical trials prohibit patients who have ever had glial head waiver. So sometimes it works and sometimes it's not working. So what about this lizifam apastine? This drug is approved for glioblastoma primary. We sometimes use it in low grade glioma that have progressed either to uh, two large clinical trial, which show that it does not add its benefit in newly diagnosed, in a, but in the recurrent is effective. So we almost never use it in the newly diagnosis, and we will not use as the beginning of treatment, which is drugs that are given intravenously, usually every two weeks, and it is very good and limited side effect in most patients, with exception in some patients that have been on it for a long time. If you use it for a long time, it was side effect, but usually less side effect. I can see issue with high blood pressure and proteinuria. And rarely receive uh, issue with blood, will not cause DVT or uh, stroke or BE. Well tolerated. Okay, what about this? This one is a prototype of a vascular in the genus uh, gross factor inhibitor or minimal toxicity widely used since 2008. And the other one, if DGF drug have been tested also, like uh, citrinib, uh, penditib, saninib, and ever aspect and MG386. All this uh, showing the abnormal blood vessel, this is a diagram. Uh, abnormal blood vessels that are made by tumor, and this actually is the reason why we see the contrast enhancement on the MRI, because the dye that circulates to this vessel is leaking out because these are not normal blood vessels in the brain. The whole idea by inhibiting this molecule is that you promote this event over here and where the vessels are front, and ultimately tumor die, and now there the picture of the people covering that area. Tremendous amount of uh, this is the map, roughly around 2008 when it was very tested in glioblastoma. And sadly, that has uh, over the years. And we have seen that it's rarely is the case that patient will have long-term survival benefit from the stroke. And they have been great effort to look at other way to target VF uh, through uh, VEGF through the, this track down here, but unfortunately, all of this 
still failure, still in failure, clinical trial failure. No, no promising till now. Here this one teacher that uh, patient, uh, this I take it from one journal. And his imam, he was diagnosed in 2010. And he was actually enrolled on one of these neurodiagnosis dozen to minute trial called Bacleo. And this tumor shrunk significantly as he won radiation and chemo. And it was pretty clear that he was getting deficit. And then ultimately after uh, many drugs, because he was having problem with kidney and tumor grow back and then put him back on the track. Longer schedule every three weeks and up and down we four weeks and tumor shrink again. That's why I start from here and shrink up to here. So it is promising, promising trial, but it's still lagging behind. So we think that a fasting can improve symptom up to now. And we call progression free survival. May length the time for tumor to progress because it can be effective at decreasing that brain is swelling. Then you can have improvement in deficit, less need for steroid. But unfortunately, not impacting survival in most of the cases. Here also angiogenesis inhibitor. So where to go with it has not been retried. It is still considered the standard that we current, it is important to try to find things that we can identify about tumor. That would suggest how going to respond to therapies and what or not. It's still on the process. So continue to be standard, set for biomarker to predict response, continue set for combination, combining of a thing with immunotherapy because him up just super steroid, better than steroid, up to now. Combinations. Treating GBM in elderly. Elderly defined age more than 70. Okay, important to talk about treating GBM in elderly. Now, no offense to anyone out there, but I don't define elderly as 70, but the study define it that way so generally speaking we know that there is a big difference between some seven years old and there's some 85 year old that are just good at 65 year old so we try not to discriminate but what has been known for a long time is that elderly patients do not tolerate radiation as well as younger patients and so what has been shown uh, so uh, is that it is better to remove as much tumor as possible, just like in young, in elderly also, a maximum resection. But what was really looked at was could you shorten the dose and time of radiation and have just good, a good outcome with less side effect. And so there was largely a study that was published last uh, couple of years in New England Journal Lesson that shows that if you give 40 gray in a state of 60 gray with uh, timozolomide, you can actually have good outcome and less side effect. And it was applicable to anyone regardless of uh, MG, MG status. So that was one of the more groundbreak recent clinical trials. 85 year old with left side weakness, GPM. MGMT methylated radi radiation, 40 GY with timozolomide after one month. Then January 14, complete 12th cy cycle of the T T TMZ. And now present on uh, observation, so promising. This was patient who in that category, he was 85. When he was diagnosed with this tumor and he had a good surgery he had radiation to the abbreviated course with 40 GY with uh, TMZ, and he ultimately has 12 cycle, and he has done extremely well, and surprisingly well, and he 
the patient that always remember when we think of don't count somebody age because they are older. Current clinical trial and future. So this is the last part of this talk. I will talk about the clinical trial. I hope you are not boring up to now. The future treatment. Uh, treatment. So we kind of uh, went through this standard treatment, which typically fa fa vaccinated radiation with timozolomide, adjuvant chemo, chemical, and some of things that we don't when tumor recur. We do not know when the tumor recur. And what I am going to show you is some of our recent clinical trial over the web. But by no means does this cover everything that is being done out there. So first, target therapy. Of all talking about the target therapy, it is very important topic. If this has been investigated for the past 10 or 15 years and continue to be investigated, this is the cartoon here. Okay, we show that growth pathway that drives the growth of glioblastoma and they have been great effort to antagonize this pathway. If you are able to read the red, because I don't think it is clear, the red one. If you are able to read the red, these are the drugs that are specifically designated to inhibit different portion of this growth pathway. Unfortunately, this have un universally failed. This trial failed. The two pathway that I want to highlight are this service receptor vascular inducer gross factor, VEGF, vascular inducer gross factor, and epidermal gross factor. All are related to the lab. And other, uh, this uh, epidermal gross factor receptor, which will uh, refer to SRS. The reason this is important is that you need to glioblastoma, but in, in other cancer, namely other cancer, also you can find this uh, VEGF and EGFR, not often confusing for uh, glioblastoma. For example, non small cell cancer, you can find all those. A very good example for another uh, tumor. This receptor in glioblastoma, and this is amplified, which means it is overexpressed. So there are a lot of this protein receptor that may to thrive and this grows, specifically variant only. And uh, we will show you in some slide of receptors that always tend on to does not require growth factor to bind to it. And so they have been great interest in targeting this pathway. The problem with this is that glioblastoma mean targeting therapy have failed. Yeah. And there can be several of this pathway because not one pathway, several um, can, if you block this, the other one will do the job. If you inhibit here, another one may drive the growth. Also, they are different in different parts of the tumor. So one part of the tumor may have one pathway driving and growth, and the another may have a very different pathway, and then we call that tumor heterogeneity. And if you try to throw a bunch of these red drugs at patient, the patient will not tolerate and develop side effects and drugs because of all the side effects when you add to cell at the end. The other one target therapy is Rindo Bibit Map. This is the first drug that came into wide use for targeting this unique area, especially unique receptor too. Glioblastoma in 10 hours is only seen roughly 20, uh, 20 to 30%. This is the receptor, 20 to 30% of GVM. So in order to be eligible for this drug, you had to have your tumor test for this indication. There were tumor, uh, two trials that were conducted, X4 and REACT X4. It's newly diagnosed, meaning that patient received uh, this medication render, this man and vaccine as they were going through the radiation and came with 
cold life, unfortunately, this also tend to be negative trial. And so random person that has also failed. However, at other clinical trial four, phase three. However, the REACT trial with was phase two was designated for recurrent glioma. Here, this phase three randomized trial newly diagnosed for DBM and patient randomized. Interim analysis show favorable of overall survival and performance factor score. And let them analysis show improved outcome in placebo because this is double blind. ACT is a double blind. Double blind study. An additional patient with laser surgery have improved survival. The status of the drug is still unknown or uncertain. No body grant in up to now. We are also phase two randomized trial. Patient at the current receive a ring to be mass plus fifty mass, placebo plus fifty mass. Seventy-three patient randomized. Preliminary results show favorable over all survived and performance score. Most patients had measurable antibody. This was targeting a uh, EGFR receptor, and this drug called. This one was a study recurrent, newly diagnosed GBM antibody bound to microtubule. Here, if you will see that, American four one four bind to EGFR, definitely deliver microtubule toxin efficacy in EGFR amplified. 50% is amplified. What this is a still promising trial, but on the process. What is the last stage? Still, I am going deep on this failure, failure trial, right? Intravenous treatment given every two weeks. A unique corneal toxicity, blur of vision, dryness, photophobia, this reduces the safety. Radiographic response seen in the recurrent glioblastoma, two patients with the partial response, 18 patients with the stable disease, 30 percent have no progress at six months. Phase one had newly diagnosed a recurrent arm. Phase two randomized trial is inactive and failed. Okay, what about the immune therapy? Take us towards the end here. You know, therapy is an extremely hot topic, not only in the neuro-oncology, but in other parts of oncology, because for many years, it has been well known that arrangement of the immune system leads to tumor growth. So ordinarily, when our immune system are functioning, the right way, they prevent our body from developing tumor, including the brain tumor. So in the brain tumor, where we have only recent stuff to see about how can we intervene on this and this space or really amazing breakthrough. And which is metastatic melanoma which used to sort of this disease with no cure. And now patients with that tumor are having roughly 50% cure rate and that of the best immune therapy. This is a cartoon of immune dysregulation. So this is a cartoon that demonstrates an immune dearrangement that are seen in the glioblastoma in the middle. This is the glioblastoma. And there is the tumor cell. And uh, what this showing is that this is normally the response that you want to have with your immune system. So these are what uh, called T lymphocytes and this can this sort of, of the patrolling around looking for foreign things and that do not belong and then get rid of them. So unfortunately, the glioblastoma cell is very smart and it has uh, things that is secretly going to be there to regulate the immune response. And so the idea of all this immune response therapy drug, it is to try shut down this, and they think back to the normal or on the many different categories of immune therapy. I'm not going to read this slide, but I'm going to go through some of the different categories for here. Just want to point out from 
the screening that giving antibody is sort of one of the more basic way of targeting the cystic. And that is the example in the window uh, showed here. So, Excuse me. Dendritic cell therapy that have uh, tested in the glyostome over the past few years. This also ICT17. Uh, this took dendritic cell, and all these are, are their immune cells that we all have in our own body that are designated to present antigen to lymphocytes. So this demonstrates lymph node and you have dendritic cell that you know it is picking up antigen. Antigen are your own things that we want our immune system to protect. Recognize here is then to protect us from it. But this does take some of the antigen from the glioblastoma and present them plus them with the dendritic cell and ultimately they are present to T lymphocyte, which we showed on the last slide. Leading to response against tumor, this was the launch in the phase three, and it has some good results in the particular immune type of patient, and then it was put into phase three randomized trial in new diagnosis patient. Unfortunately, this trial was recently called as the result of pharmaceutical company going bankrupt. A lot of, uh, you know, bankrupt and some issues. So there are other kind of dendritic cell therapy. Another one I could have showed you in the DC, but which some of you may know about it more than me. Okay, gene 511 is an engineered murine leukemia retrovise. Okay, and Gene mediated treatment. A good example for this is TUCA5 trial, which was recently completed in phase two. And this is very interesting concept. This is a virus that has been engineered when it inserted a time of surgery to convert their drug called 5FC into VFU, uh, which is well known cancer drug. That idea here is the circumventing the blood frame barrier because. If we give five to glioblastoma patients through intravenous road, it would not get into the brain. So some people refer to this as the Trojan horse. Take treatment by you, getting giving the drug that can get into the brain, that is converted once it gets into side of cavity. So very interesting concept, finally. And I want to talk a little bit here about BD1 and BDL, immune dysregulation checkpoint inhibitor. One drug are also referred to checkpoint inhibitor, and what this do is that the lyoblastoma has number of things that is secret, secreted on its surface. Many things secreted on the surface of glioblastoma and uh, called, one of them is called BDL, one which interacts with the BD1, okay? And leading to death of the immune cell. If you can antagonize this BD1 and BDL, if you can antagonize it or inhibit this interaction with the drug like uh, nivolabam or uh, temporal regime, and these are two up to now, FDA approved, but we not use it in the GCC. Then you can lead to this proliferation up there and you can achieve the result as you want. BD1 inhibitor, nivolumab and uh, bimopralazimab, those both, as I mentioned. Name of this drug, Another way of doing this is giving BDL1 drug. And this one, their volume, antibody is representative of that drug, which is being tested in the glioblastoma clinical trial. Our number of approved indications for this drug, and other cancer, and I think this 
uh, is actually up to six and growing and then there are ongoing trial still no no promising result up to now checkmate uh, also is one important trial because it was really the very large trial that was completed so they call this checkmate or check cash malik or whatever one four three and it was uh, for recurrent glioblastoma unfortunately it was a negative study but like in many trials some patients really benefit so most of our patients tolerate the drug well without any serious side effect and so now the idea is trying to combine bd1 inhibitor with other kind of amino therapy like dendritic saliva vaccine or gene mediated or other drugs okay lastly i want to talk about viral therapy and which have had fair amount of press and publication and these are interesting we refer to this as uncle each virus or attenuated virus and what they are virus that are designed not to harm a normal body don't harm the normal body and not normal brain cell they are really engineered to bind to receptors that are only glioblastoma cells and this is the list of different viruses that have been tested adenovirus herpes uh, rheovirus mesenovirus and a still ongoing trial up to now and this is a cartoon that show kind of uh, what is going here from a testing up to here b c and finally lead to this of the cell this virus come along and it bind to surface of the tumor and start injecting itself and you know quote unquote infecting the tumor cell but what interesting about this is that often lead to secondary immune response and um, by respond we want to gain that typical shutdown for the glioblastoma so last not least this is the summary and take home message i want to say in summary is that glioblastoma is an important disease because it really involves a lot of teamwork you know there are many different players involved as i showed you earlier slide and a very challenging uh, tumor and we just need better treatment for this and there's some newer way of surgery that can lead to better tumor tumor removal because we know that one of the important prognostic factor a lot of uh, medical management that goes into taking care of this patient and this is the reason why i feel like uh, many neurosurgeons it is important person a part of a uh, team because many little issue that have to be attended and to we talk about the standard treatment of glioblastoma important about radiation and elderly patient the role of uh, a pristine or bpc map is uh, evolving now and will continue to evolve i hope in the future it will be better and came of a new treatment targeting therapy are important will continue to be important even so there have been a lot of failure in the trial and this area treatment will not be the ban immunotherapy is probably that most hot and active area for research for the coming new years uh, years right now clinical trial are important up to now and cannot underestimate enough clinical trial is important so thank you for your listening very good very good guy for excellent presentation well illustrated precise uh before i open it up to the panel i'd like to introduce a few people in the panel so because one of the values beside the excellent ex present presentation you had is the networking possibilities. I'd like to introduce a guy that's been with us from the beginning, Carlos Umaguano. Carlos, are you there? Yes, hello, hello, John. I, I, uh, I, in the interested in the conference, I think uh, this was uh, it's about an actually 
the exposure of the topic was very reliable. Uh, echo sound, echo and sound. Yeah, I, I, we're having a problem understanding, Carlos. I guess you're on a Wi-Fi connection. But Carlos is a neurosurgeon from Ecuador. He's in Spain now. Okay, let me introduce the other members first. Uh, Osman, could you please introduce yourself? We haven't met you yet. Okay, you there, Osman? Uh, maybe not, maybe not. Okay, okay. Why don't we just turn it over to the panel and uh, at, you can ask after some questions or comments. Uh, so the floor is now open. Any questions or comments? Mujahid, are you? I don't know if people have met you. Are you Mujahid, are you there now? Mujahid? Mogi? Are you there? Maybe not. Okay, any other questions or comments from the panel? My home. Okay, Vanta, you have any comments or questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, for Dr. Gaffa. Thank you for your. Yeah. Oh, you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gaffa, for your nice presentation. And as you know, the management of the glioblastoma is very complex and it is a, a, a multidisciplinary team. And uh, the survival, survival rate is still uh, very, very low. And it's very interesting for me that you mentioned about the new research, new technique, and also about the viral injection when we operate the patient. Sorry, I couldn't hear well. You hear me? Some echo in the sound. Not clear. Hello, Jafar. Hello, Jafar. Yes. I didn't get the comment. We'll get better with this technology. We're just learning it. Uh, Vanta, could you repeat your comment to Gaffer, please? What about the public health service? Yes, yes. I, I have no comment, just I thank you very much for your okay. presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? Mogi, do you have any comments or questions? Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello? Go ahead, Mogi, go ahead. Yeah, that uh, already multidisciplinary team, I mentioned. Social worker can do the public health service and do this job. And it is better to involve more community in this uh, devastating channel uh, disease. Because you know, multidisciplinarity. Every everybody can help. Well, you know, one comment I like to make. I'm not a neurosurgeon. I'm a regular doctor, but. Uh, I can see the survival rate has quadrupled since 1940, although it's still pretty grim. At least it's going up a little bit. Mayor Moose, you have any comments or questions? Yeah, just unmute yourself there, Mayor Moose. People like me in training. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mamush. Uh, Osman, do you have any comments or questions? Hello, Osman, are you there? I can unmute you. Okay. Okay, Carlos asked, uh, uh, Carlos asked a question, he text, texted, is it possible for all people or people from the private sector? I guess he was referring to one of the treatments. Carlos, what, what, what treatment are you referring to? Could you text, please, what you said? Can you hear me okay, Gaffer? Yeah. 
Yeah, he's Carlos Umaguano, the neurosurgeon from Spain, is asking: Is it possible for all people, or just for the private sector? What are you referring to, Carlos? Can you please text what you're referring to? Which treatment you're referring to? The treatment. Uh, one. I'm just trying to get the question straightened out. With, with uh, Carlos had a comment. I'm not sure what, what he meant when he said, is it possible for people, uh, for all people or just for the private sector? I imagine he's referring to one of the treatments you were discussing. Is that correct, Carlos? Okay. Well, I guess, well, it's okay. We'll get better with this tech. We're having a little trouble with communicating, et cetera. Uh, standard treatment, radiation chemotherapy, apply for all people. Okay, for all and people. get the question right. Okay. Hello, okay. Jaffa. Uh, yes. Let's see here. Joffrey, yeah, I, can you talk now? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, how are you? I need to talk? Yes, go ahead, Osman. Uh, I am a Sudanese and you're a Syrian uh, resident. Uh, talking from Saudi Arabia. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, I think this treatment of uh, GBM must be uh, dependent at first yeah. on the uh, clinical uh, clinical uh, presentation of patient. Uh, some patient was found is uh, in uh, the last, uh, especially in Sudan, found is uh, no benefit from the treatment. You agree this point? When can patient in uh, low GSS and uh, weakness, uh, what's and very elderly, it is a uh, uh, benefit from this treatment and intervention like this is aggressive surgery and uh, long period treatment with uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy. And what's the first will, uh, will be uh, choice? Radiotherapy is the first for this patient or intervention with uh, surgeries and radiotherapy. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Very, very, very good question. Yeah, as I mentioned, here on the people they put category as elderly, but I have again is that everybody deserves chance. Okay, if uh, you are in the well set up uh, situation and patient came to you, you have to follow the standard. You would do surgery, people think, for example, if and then. Uh, if confirmed that is uh, GBM, histobasologically, then you will go for uh, this radiation and chemical treatment. Because up to now, here in this study from USA, elderly people, 85 years of old, benefit from uh, these issues. But at the end, you will evaluate your patient. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Jafar. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello, Jafar. Yes. Uh, we have comment from Mr. Daraj here from Sudan. He is supervisor of our meeting, Sudan meeting, every Tuesday and Sunday. Okay. Thank you, Jafar. And thanks for all uh, people who are attending uh, this meeting. And uh, I think you have uh, the, the topic so thoroughly that uh, one uh, might uh, come with the good idea about management of this condition, but I think it's still the uh, same as the red wall in uh, delineating so many hidden uh, aspects of this no problem. No, uh, because still now we are uh, we are uh, okay. In the same area without uh, 
Sorry, I believe we're having some audio problems. I don't know. Does everyone else agree? Can everyone, anyone understand what's being said? Yes. Okay. Well, okay. Well, Gaffer, let me take, let me take this opportunity to close. We're having some audio problems with your connection. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I will send you the link, Muhaid, uh, and we look forward to further presentations with your organization in Sudan. Okay, Ogi? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, the sound is clearly right. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Especially Gaffer. you. Especially, especially you, Gaffer. Thanks thank for the time. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye.